Good evening, everybody. Pink Floyd are arguably one of the most influential bands in rock music's history. And Bruce Swedeen is one of the most acclaimed recording engineers in the history of recorded music. Well, of course, you could argue, you know, who's the real number one, but that's beside the point. One thing is clear. Both of them, Pink Floyd and Bruce Swedeen, they're one of the best in the business. They have extreme expertise at what they do. And I guess most of you have heard about Pink Floyd, at least I hope so. But for those of you who didn't know about Bruce Swedeen, Bruce Swedeen was Michael Jackson's longtime recording engineer. And he not only recorded Michael Jackson, not just that, but he actually invented and built uh, wooden platforms that allowed for him to record Michael Jackson the way he sang with finger snaps, with foot stomps, all of that. And you might wonder, you know, uh, besides music, what do they and a lot of other people have in common? Well, they have been fooled, despite their expertise. They have been fooled by a man who goes by the name of Hugo Tuccarelli. Hugo Tuccarelli invented a recording system he, he termed holophonics. And it was based on the idea of his idea that the human cochlea, when we hear, produces 3D holograms of sound. And this is how we hear. And then his system could actually replicate that and put it on tape. Well, it sounds kind of, you know, weird. And that's true because it's all bullshit. Um, so the only thing that he actually did was uh, build a dummy head and then make very, very stereophonic uh, recordings out of that. Now, James Randi, to quote him, used to say, no matter how smart or well-educated you are, you can be deceived, you can be fooled. And these examples prove that. And there's a man in this room who knows all about that and more. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Johan Brackman. Thank you very much. Thank you also, Alex, for your kind introduction. Thank you for the invitation. Can everybody hear me when I speak like I'm speaking now, also in the back? Okay. Can you also read this in the back? Because um, there's some pictures that, uh, well, it would be better if you would be more in the front here. But anyway, we'll see. If you would notice that you'd, you're missing certain things that I'm showing here, just come forward, all right? We are healthy people here, no Ebola, as far as I know. So feel free to come uh, forward, okay? As uh, Alex just said, um, I will talk about being deceived, uh, about, about why it is that people are still even in the 21st century, with all our scientific knowledge and experience and so on, why we are still so vulnerable, as I call it, for irrationalism. Of course, maybe you are already thinking uh, what might be irrational to you is not necessarily irrational for me. We could discuss this and debate this, of course. But broadly speaking, what I'm calling irrational are ideas, opinion, bits or parts of information that really fly in the face of what we know from the perspective of scientific methodologies or scientific knowledge. For instance, if you would still believe that the Earth is flat, that would be very irrational. Okay, so that, that's broadly speaking my definition. I'm not going to give a uh, a lecture on philosophy of science, but philosophers of science are dealing with the so-called demarcation problem. But I'm going to talk about truly, I think, undebatable, irrational forms of thinking, the clear cases. Some of you, of course, will disagree. So let me already point out, um, this is nothing personal, right? If I offend you because I'm calling something really irrational that you think is true, or that works for you, or you think you have arguments. Um, well, 
I still hope we, I hope we can still be friends, all right? Because this is nothing personal. But my general point here is that most people probably, even also in this room, are still very prone to irrational thinking. Although we are highly educated, uh, we have developed science over the last four or five centuries, we have philosophy of science, we have developed logic and so on. But the human mind is still the human mind. That, that's, that's my main intake here. You probably all know somebody from your inner circle, your friends, your family, who believes in something truly weird, something what I would call, as I just more or less defined it, something very irrational. And it's, it's often it's an embarrassing thing, because you, you ask yourself, and you, you tell your friends, and you wonder, how is it possible that such a smart person, he could be an engineer, or he has a PhD in chemistry, or whatever, is a very smart person, and he believes in this or that, something truly weird. And I could give, unfortunately, in a sense, I could give many, many examples. We all know somebody like that. If you don't know who it is in your circle, it's probably yourself. <laughs> right? So this is a very common thing. It's the way we still are. So that's my main topic. Why is this? Why we are still vulnerable for irrationalism? And maybe I'll talk also about how to deal with this. Okay? Maybe you can say, so what? It's a very human thing. It's part of who we are. So why would we be against it? Well, that's an ethical or a moral issue in a sense, right? Maybe we can discuss this uh, after the lecture. Of course, I'm not the, the first one to point this out. Quite on the contrary. Here, for instance, you see an 18th century work of art, a gravure, by a man, an English uh, artist named William Hogarth, and it's called Credulity, Superstition, and Fanaticism. That, that kind of gives it away already. So, and he's pointing out, or mocking, I think, several superstitions of his day, 18th century. Here, for instance, you see a, a woman giving birth to rabbits. Here is a man vomiting uh, nails and stuff. The priest is talking about witches and the devil, and, and the people are, are listening attentively and obviously believing everything he says. So the artist is mocking this and probably also regretting it. Now, I think, as a thought experiment, if we would be able to ask William Hogart, the, the artist, 18th century, if he would think that in the 21st century people would still believe in these things, I think he would say, no, they will not believe this anymore, uh, they're going to be more educated, science will have made progress, people will have become smarter, they will not be superstitious, uh, they, not, they, they, will not, they will not believe these kind of things anymore. Now, I think he would have been wrong in believing that, because I think we still have the same brain as in the 18th century, and that same brain is still very vulnerable for all kinds of things. Not to anything. This is a, an important thing that I must point out. In a sense, it's very easy to make people believe the most irrational, unbelievable things. But not quite everything. There are certain limits to what people will accept and what they will not accept. And, and that's, kinda, that's a giveaway to understand how the mind works when it comes to irrationality. Try to remember this. I'll come back to it. So in general, again and again, you'll see that there's a persistency of irrational thinking also in the age of science. Just giving one example here. Since the 70s, people who want to have a baby, but for some reason they cannot have a baby, they can go to a fertility clinic. We have in vitro fertilization, we have modern science, we have all kinds of techniques. We know what fertility is about. We know how you can be pregnant, can become pregnant. We've heard about egg cells and sperm and everything. So science is pre pretty much up to date when it comes to getting pregnant or about the reasons why a woman uh, is not able to get to, to be pregnant. Nevertheless, the worshipping of the penis here, as you can see here, which is a, a ritual in Japan to ask for fertility, is still very popular. It is just one of the many, many examples I can give. 
Things like this, superstition like this, goes on in many, many countries, also in Western European countries. This is a little collection I made myself on a slide. It's my, my own work of William Gogert from the 21st century. I could also call it superstition, fanaticism, and credulity. You don't see a woman giving birth to rabbits. We don't believe in that anymore. But we do believe in other things now. For instance, the flat earth is still something that people believe in. There's an organization called the Flat Earth Society. You can look it up. You'll also find it's the name of a rock band, but it's also an official society promoting the belief that, or the theory, if you want to call it like that, that the earth is flat. Now, you might think that these people don't really know what they're talking about. And, and in a sense, that's true. In a sense, there's something crazy about it, right? They have several of hundreds of members. But on the other hand, they've heard about the round earth theory. They know they have a very eccentric opinion about the shape and the form of the earth. So you could think, you, you know what, these people are just wrongly informed. I'll go to a meeting and I'll talk to them. I'll, I'll show them some pictures of the round earth. I'll, I'll teach them some astronomy. And then they will all be thankful. They will tell me, we're so lucky that you came around because we really thought the earth was flat, but now we know better. <laughs> right? We changed our mind after your lecture. We all know this is not what's going to happen. These people are going to be very, very dedicated to their highly irrational opinion. Whatever you will point out to them, they will have an answer. In fact, chances are they're going to know more about the round earth theory that we all accept than you and I know. Because let's face it, how do we know that the earth is round, right? If, if we show them pictures, they'll tell you, but you have to be very gullible to believe that these pictures are real. Anybody can Photoshop these pictures and so on, you know? So before you know it, it's you who are going to have a hard time in explaining your opinion. Maybe in the end, you're going to join their club. Right? Who knows? Right? So it's not that easy. But nevertheless, you know, we all agree here, I think, that believing that the earth is flat is very irrational. But highly educated people, several hundreds of them, still believe it. People still believe in witches. People believe in telepathy. People believe in astrology. People believe in aliens making green circles or crop circles. People believe in ghosts. Millions of people bought a book called The Secret, a very irrational book, and so on. I could give hundreds, even thousands of examples. And of course, the more examples I'm giving, the more I'm going to lose the audience, right? Because I can give 20 examples or 30 examples, and you will all say, yes, this is incredible that people believe all this. And then I'm giving example 46, and you're going to jump up and say, whoa, but there you are wrong. Because I have experienced this myself, and I can assure you, it works, and so on. Well, I have to ask you, reconsider, right? Because you have to be consequential, so to speak, right? If you accept that A, B, and C, and D is highly irrational, I think all the examples that I'm going to give are in the same order of irrationality. Many, many people nowadays, for instance, believe in so-called alternative medicine. This is very popular. I'm not even sure exactly what it is, but burning a candle in your ear, for some people, <laughs> seems to be a very healthy thing. There are several hundreds of alternative medicines like this. Homeopathy, for instance, is very, very popular. I'm quite sure people in this room are using sometimes homeopathic medicine. Maybe without really knowing what it is, people associate it with herbs and stuff, it has nothing to do with that. I don't have the time to go into the details here, but look it up, truly look it up, what it is, and if you know a little bit of chemistry, and if you know what the double blind randomized control study is, if you don't know, look it up. <laughs> You'll have to agree with me that homeopathy is really, really irrational. But it's, it's very interesting to ask yourself the question, why do so many people believe in it? 
And I think these so-called alternative medicines are a great example to discuss. Because mainly the way we deal with information is still the way we, we've dealt with information as we did in the prehistory. We had our senses, we had personal experiences, we had memories, and we had the information that the members of our group, people that we trusted on average, gave us. That's it. And that's still who we are. And if you're taking an alternative pill now, and there's research that points out, you know what, it really doesn't work. It's the same as a placebo, right? say. But you've taken it, and after three or four days you feel better, it's very, very, very seductive to believe that there's a causal connection between the so-called pill and you feeling better, right? But that's an anecdote. That's just your personal experience. I've taken this pill, and after a couple of days I felt better. So it must be because of the pill, right? But of course, maybe the opposite is true. Maybe without the pill, you would have been better after one day. Maybe the pill worked backwards. Who's to say? And maybe this sounds ridiculous, but if you think about it, you know I have a point here, right? How are you going to know? You're not going to know it just from personal experience. That's anecdotal. But that doesn't count. You have to do a randomized, double-blind, statistically uh, appropriate study, right? That's the way you have to deal with it. People still believe in the Loch Ness Monster and, and various other examples. Many people believe 9-11 was an inside job, right? As if Bush was smart enough to come up with this, right? That's, but there's many, many other reasons why this is extremely highly unlikely, highly irrational. Nevertheless, many people believe this, smart people, educated people. And they get carried away endlessly and defending very, very strange, to say the least, theories. This is a local example. A man from the Netherlands built Noah's Ark, truly believing that Noah existed six, seven thousand years ago, that the book of Genesis is literally true, and so on. He's a young earth creationist. You all know what young earth creationism is, I think, is the belief that the earth. The whole cosmos, in fact, is younger than 10,000 years, which is extremely irrational. If you think about it, believing that the Earth is flat is less irrational. <laughs> I mean this seriously. Say I'm a flat Earther, I can accept that Mars is round, Venus is round, Jupiter is round, the Moon is round, I can accept the whole universe is 13 billion years old, I can accept evolutionary theory, I can accept everything in science. Except for one small detail, I do not accept that the Earth is round. It happens to be flat. But for the rest, I accept everything in science. Right? But the young Earth creationist does not accept geology, cosmology, biology, uh, archaeology. He almost doesn't accept anything at all. Right? Not even language theories that we have in science because he believes in the Tower of Babel story and so on, you know. So this is much more extremely irrational even than the flat earth theory, just to give you an idea. And that is here, right? Also in the United States, you know, 45% of the people. Because you, you could have said, well, you know what, that flat earth uh, theory, that's, that's all interesting and funny, but that's very, very marginal. Normal people are not like that. But it's 45% of the people in the United States. And then you can say, well, yes, but the United States, yeah. <laughs> but this is here. And there's several hundreds of thousand people believing this here too. Right? So I'm not, I don't want to say anything about people of the United States, also not about people of the Netherlands. I'm saying something about human species in general. Right? We are still very, very vulnerable. So the question is, of course, what makes us so vulnerable? That's the topic of my talk of today. And then some people say, well, you know what? That's just the way it is. People are like this. Tell me what you want to believe, and I will tell you what you will believe. That's how people are. People want to be deceived, so that it's easy to deceive them. And I think that's true. But the question, of course, remains, why are we like that? 
Why is it? This still needs an explanation in itself. And there are several possible explanations. Maybe it's just lack of knowledge. But I told you already, in most cases, it's not. Maybe if you use homeopathy because your mother gave it to you when you were a child and you're still using it, and you still feel healthy, you're still alive, right? So you believe, oh, probably it works because I'm running around here, so it has to work. So maybe you're ignorant of what it really is. Could be true. But for many cases, it's not just a lack of knowledge. I think it's a combination of these factors. Sometimes all four of them, sometimes just one is enough, sometimes maybe two or three. And I will talk about most of them if I have the time. I will focus especially on this. I do think that our proneness to irrationalism or to be superstitious is in fact a side effect of normal psychology. It's not people with mental diseases or with something psychopathological that are vulnerable for irrationalism. It's healthy people, people like you and I. It's people with jobs, with degrees, with partners, with children maybe, and so on. But they also have very weird beliefs on the side, almost as it were. As a side effect, I think, of our normal psychology. I'll give examples to make the point. And I also will talk, if I have the time, about cognitive dissonance, about the fact that irrationality can be an interesting thing to define your identity, and about the fact that we are group animals, and our psychology is formed by this group psychology, and that's why we're still very prone to group pressure. Maybe some of you, especially the psychologists, of course, will know the classic experiments of Christopher Ashe, Right, this is old in a sense, but still very, very relevant. Turns out it's very easy to make people believe really strange things if enough other people in the group believe it or fake that they believe it. That doesn't really matter. So in general, this, this picture here of Bansky is almost a metaphor for my, my idea here. Right? We are like this person a prehistoric figure, he has fast food in his hands, right? So he's projected in the 21st century. Well, we are like this. We have a brain and a mind that's still prehistorical, but we're living in the 21st century. And often this works well, but also very often it goes astray, right? Just like when you have a body and a metabolism that's designed, so to speak, evolutionary designed for very, very different foods than fast food, right? And that's we, we all become too fat and, and get sugar disease, diabetes, and so on. How many of you have seen the James Randi documentary? A couple of weeks ago? Okay, not everybody. This is James Randi. If you don't know who James Randi is, shame on you. So this is your homework then, find out who James Randi is, read his books, watch his clips on YouTube and see the documentary. It's really interesting and he's one of my heroes. He is a man giving lectures all over the world to explain why pseudoscience and irrationalism is something you must get rid of. The question I have to ask is of course, is he and many other people like him is he fighting a losing battle? Because as I pointed out in the beginning, we had this picture of, picture of William Hogart, but 21st century, it's still the same, apparently. Of course, we cannot really scientifically compare this. We don't have surveys from the 18th century, of course, right? But nevertheless, superstition is still abundantly out there. So maybe he's fighting a losing battle, right? I'm not sure whether that's true. So I'm going to ask the question, but more in the end, what can we do about it? I do think that just explaining to people why this particular form of irrational, irrationalism doesn't work or is unscientific or, or totally crazy or whatever, and then explaining why another form of pseudoscientific thinking is not really working at all and so on, it's not going to do the thing. I think 
what's more interesting is to try to figure out why the brain works like this, why we are still so vulnerable for any kind of irrational thinking. Right? So that, that's another inclination, so to speak, to deal with this. So we need to understand, as it were, the logic behind the psychological mechanisms that make us vulnerable to recognize the pitfalls before we fall into them. This is my metaphor. If you believe in something that's very irrational, you've fallen into a pitfall. In Dutch, an, an denkput. This is a word I invented myself, denkput. So, so use it and, and mention my name. <laughs> Once you're, you've fallen into a cognitive pitfall, the interesting thing is you're not going to realize it. Quite on the contrary, you're going to think you are right and that everybody else is wrong. But it's you down in the pitfall. And then other people will point that out. They will tell you, well, you believe in something totally unbelievable. And they will give arguments for it. And they will you know, give their hand to, to get you out of the pitfall. But nine out of ten times what people do, once you're in the pitfall, they're going to reject the hand and going to find arguments to stay in the pitfall. And that, that way you're digging yourself deeper and deeper and deeper into it. That's the way it works. So it's more important to understand how this happens than to give the arguments why your particular line of belief is wrong. See my, my point here? Okay. Let me give you an, anal an analogy of what I mean, and this is the most important thing, of what I mean when I talk about it's a side effect of normal human psychology. I guess most of us are familiar with optical illusions, right? Here, for instance, you see a square called A, and here you see a square called B. Can you also see this in the back? Yes? Okay. So you all see probably that this is kind of whitish and this is more dark, okay? Well, in reality, they have the same color. They're exactly the same. If you're not familiar with this, it's hard to believe. Well, look it up. You'll see that I'm right. They have exactly the same color. If we would be able to cover the screen here with carbon paper or something, we cannot do this, but well, we could, but we don't have the time. But just trust me on this, okay? If we would be able to cover everything here on the screen, except square A and square B, you would see that almost magically, instantly, they would have the same color. Although, of course, we didn't change anything on the screen. What's changed is the perception in your brain. You see color not with your eyes, you see color with your brain, of course. Your senses are just extensions of your brain. Right? Why is the brain doing this? Is it trying to make fun of us? Is it trying to deceive us? Of course not. We are our brain in a certain sense. Right? So that would be the brain deceiving itself. It doesn't want to do this. But it's still doing it. Why? Well, because of course the psychologist or the artist who made this is pushing the right buttons in the brain. He or she knew that the brain is constantly trying to make sense of what's out there, and that's coming in through our five senses. We know that, for instance, the brain takes into account where the sun is. It uses shadow. It uses many other things to figure out what's going on there, and then it attaches, so to speak, color to it. So here it thinks, well, you know what, this a thing here, a cylinder, kind of a tower, the sun probably is there because I see a shadow here. This is all unconscious, right? It goes instantly. This is black, this is white, this is black, this is white, and so on. So this must be whitish. It's surrounded by blackish squares. So this must be blackish because it's surrounded by whitish squares or forms and so on. So your brain instantly comes up with a solution for this problem and it says this is dark, this is white. While in fact, this is totally untrue. Your brain is doing this to help you. But still, it's wrong. 
Here, of course, you might say that's no problem because we know it's wrong. Well, if I didn't tell you, you probably wouldn't have known. But now you know. The interesting thing is also you cannot undo this. If you tell your brain, you know what, you're wrong, show this to me like it really is, it's not going to work, right? Just like with this illusion, it's called the hollow face illusion. Here you see a mask with the nose to the front. This is the back of the mask. But you also see it with the nose to the front, right? Why is that? Because your brain doesn't really know what the mask is. It only has evolutionary experience with normal faces. And a normal face always has the nose protruding, right? If I would see a face here with the nose flipped, that would be impossible. You would be dead. You could not exist. So then my brain is thinking, if I see a face with the nose on the backside of the head, there must be something wrong with my eyes. So I need to correct this. So your brain is correcting this. I'm going to show you a clip, takes 30 seconds, to make the point a little bit more, more clear. So what you see is a mask that's rotating. There's no trickery involved. So now we're going to see the back. There it is. And most people will also see a normal face, so to speak, right? Why is that? Because your brain instantly is flipping it into what it believes to be correct, while in fact your brain makes a mistake. So you've fallen into a cognitive pitfall, right? And you cannot get out of it. In this particular example, you're going to think, well, this is interesting, but it's, and it's, it's fun, it's kind of fun, it's something to do with friends and family, if you want to entertain people, but maybe it's not really important. Well, I think it's highly important, because this is the, the way the brain works, not just with visual input, but also with the processing of cognitive information in general. Again, here we know that the brain is making a mistake, right? But when you think about certain things, when you, when you develop a theory, so to speak, about certain things, it's much, much harder to accept that your brain is making mistakes, right? So that's, in a sense, the most important thing that I have to say tonight. But I'm going to go a little bit more in detail now, and I'm going to discuss <clears throat> a couple of reasons, maybe, maybe four or five, depending on the time I have, why we have that vulnerability. As I said, for me, the most important reason is that it is, in fact, kind of a side effect of the way the, norm, the brain normally works, just like with the optical illusions. It's a good thing that the brain can see faces, right? And faces have the nose protruding. That's a good thing. That's a normal thing. It's important to recognize a face as soon as possible as a face. Because usually, when you see a face, it's going to be a human being, and human beings are important for us, right? So if you would look at a human face and you would ask yourself, what is this thing that I'm seeing there? That's not good. We are survivors or we are uh, nakomelingen, what's the, what's the children, grandchildren and so on, of people who recognize faces just like that. But sometimes, in a, in a sense, it overshoots. It works too good. So as a side effect, you can also see a face while there's really no face at all, or while you're looking at the backside of a mask. Okay. You understand the point here. So this is the side effect explanation. So I'm, I'm giving you the example of the belief in ghosts. Why do we believe in ghosts? Maybe you don't believe in ghosts, but many people do. In fact, 30% of the people here, Western European societies, do believe in ghosts. By ghosts, classical ghosts, 30% who believe in them, I mean something like this, right? You know, a whitish figure. Uh, you can encounter them uh, at uh, graveyards, for instance, or in certain old houses where maybe somebody committed suicide and so on. I mean, you, you, know, you all have an idea of what a ghost is, if it would exist, right? 30% of the people believe in ghosts like that, which is already quite high, I think, considering the fact that 
ghosts are very, the existence of ghosts is a highly unlikely thing. But if I would believe, if I would define a ghost a little bit more broadly as the psychological stuff that remains after you die, then the percentage rises, of course. People call that a soul or a spirit. We just don't use the word ghost for that anymore. If you go to a funeral and the priest is talking about uh, the person who died, he will talk about his soul is now in heaven or things like this. He will not say things like his ghost is now flying to heaven. He's using different words. While in fact it's the same thing. It's a psychological unity that is still there after the body is gone, right? This is, of course, attached to belief in the afterlife, say, in reincarnation, say, in souls, in mediums, people who can talk with the dead. It's correlated with the possibility to get in touch with the dead. It's correlated, of course, with the belief in haunted houses, and so on, and so on. So this is a widely believed thing, the existence of ghosts, souls, and so on. Many people here probably believe also in something like this, a psychological entity that remains there after your body is gone. I think this belief comes as a normal side effect of the way the brain works. Why is that? Well, one of the things is that we are all born dualists. What I mean by that is that we make an intuitive distinction between a body and a mind. The philosopher Descartes said that as if it was true. It's one of the basic elements of his philosophy. For him, it was true. In fact, his whole dualistic philosophy is just normal intuition, but brought forward in a very complicated way, in a sophisticated way. But almost everybody is Cartesian in that respect. Why is that? Because, of course, that's the way we see each other. If you think about it, I look at you, what I see are bodies, bags of skin with some hair on top of it here and there. That's what I see, right? You see a bag of skin with some clothes on it and some, some things that are moving and there's a hole and, and there's sound coming out of that hole. If you would be an alien scientist visiting the planet and you're sitting here, that's what you would describe in your scientific report. There's bags of skins and they're making a lot of noise sometimes and they're walking around. You wouldn't be able to make sense of it. But we human beings, we do not just see the bag of skin, the body. We immediately also take into account there's something psychological inside it. Although I cannot see this, if you think about it, I know there's thoughts and emotions and things you wish, things you feel, memories, ideas and all that, that, that's somewhere inside you. But if I crack your skull and look for it, I'm not going to find it. I'm not going to find an idea in your brain. Oh, the only thing I'm going to find is matter, hard matter or soft matter when it comes to your brain. So it's not a big step to believe that when the body's gone, the mental stuff still is there somewhere. It's, as philosophers would say, it's ontologically something totally different. So we are born dualists. Even if you're a scientist and you know something about neurobiology and you accept that the mind is also something attached to the brain and when the brain's gone, there's no mind anymore, it's still very hard not to be a dualist somehow. Also atheists, or people who explicitly say, I'm not a dualist, I don't believe in a soul and so on, can have conversations with their dead father or mother, for instance, right? at certain moments. So it's a very normal human thing, except when you have autism or some form of autism. It's, it's one of the giveaways of autism, that you, you see the, the bodies and less the psychology. You don't see, as psychologists would tell it, you don't see or you don't have the theory of mind as other people do. So believing in ghosts, I think, is a natural outcome of our evolved or normal or what they call folk psychology. Psychologists are actually now studying the way this works. For instance, 
with children, if you're into developmental psychology, you'll know this. Children, say four or five years old, you can try this at home if, 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 you, if there happens to be a child running around somewhere, uh, use it, okay? And ask the question, say there's a mouse running around and the mouse is hungry and say it's also angry, it just had a fight with another mouse and it enters a trap and in a second it's killed, the mouse is dead. And then you ask the child, can the mouse still run around? All children will tell you, no, of course not, it's dead. A dead mouse cannot run around anymore. It's a stupid question. Right? But if you then ask, is the mouse still hungry and is it still angry? They all will tell you, yes, of course it is. It's still angry, it's still hungry. Why is that? Because children spontaneously believe in psychological continuity. The body's gone or dead, doesn't function anymore, but the mental stuff is still there. So this comes as a natural thing to people. We have all theory of mind. As I said, people with autism, in fact, suffer from the fact they do not have theory of mind, and that's also why they believe less in ghosts. And there's been some research on this. And another aspect of this whole reasoning is that we all have a spontaneous intentionality form of thinking. When I look at you and you look at me, we are trying to figure out what our intentions are. In other words, we are born mind readers, not in the paranormal way, of course, but we try to figure out what's going on. Is he bored? Does she think it's interesting? Does she think my joke works? And so we're trying to figure that out constantly. When, when I do this, it's very hard to resist not to look there, right? You want to figure out what I'm, what's going on in my mind, right? So you follow my behavior. In fact, as a form of reverse engineering to know what's going on in my mind. That, that's, that's what we mean with reading or trying to comprehend intentionality. So the belief in ghosts, I think, is also very attached to the belief, which is a true belief, of course, in a sense, that we are, we are intentional beings. But if you are a dualist and you believe that after the body is gone, the mental stuff is there, then it's also very easy to believe that that mental stuff still has intentionality, still has ideas and wishes and wants to do actions, wants to tell you something, wants to communicate with you, and so on. This comes as a normal, natural form of thinking to most people. Let me give you another clip, or show you another clip. It's an old one, made by two psychologists decades ago, we wanted to figure out how intentional thinking actually works. Also with children, but it works for adults just as well. So what we see, or what we're about to see, are some geometric figures, a triangle, um, a circle, and they are randomly moving around at the screen, or on the screen. But almost all of you is not giving this a random interpretation. You actually are making up a story. You give intentions to these things. And you give a mind to it. This is a bully. These two maybe have a relation. It is scared now. <laughs> this is all psychology that you are attaching to the random movements of nonsensical geometrical figures. So there's danger involved now. He has to figure out a plan to rescue her and so on. <laughs> this is what's going on in your mind. You turn this into a soap story. <laughs> and if I stop this before it's finished, people often are a little bit angry because they want to know how it ends. <laughs> <laughs> but of course it does not end. There's no story. That's nonsense. Right? So the believing ghosts attaches itself to our normal form or ways of thinking. Right? This is also why somebody like me, I do not believe in ghosts, but I can enjoy ghost movies. When they're made good, that is when they are in the right frame of normal human psychology. Remember when I told you we can almost believe anything as long as it's in the right 
frame, so to speak. Well, this is a good example. As long as the incredible stories do not clash with our natural psychology, people will accept them. For instance, myself, when I'm watching a ghost movie, I, I don't believe in ghosts, but when it's well made, it can scare me. And I can look at the ghost movie, and I see a ghost going through walls, or somebody falls dead, and then his ghost appears. You, you've seen these movies. The ghost floats around, and gravity doesn't mean anything anymore, right? And it flies straight through the wall, and so on. And it tries to communicate with, uh, with people who are still alive, and so on. And I'm thinking, whoa, this is a good movie. And it scares me. I'm not going to be able to sleep, maybe, right? Well, of course, it's a totally ridiculous story when you think about it. If that same ghost then goes again through the wall, but instead of going through the wall, it, it um, clashes with the wall and it falls down, then I'm going to say, it, this is a ridiculous movie. Because <laughs> a ghost does not behave like that. Right? Because my natural psychology tells me a ghost must go through the wall. Because it's not made up of matter and atoms and molecules anymore. It's just spiritual stuff, so to speak. So it cannot clash with the wall. So the one thing is just normal, the other thing sounds crazy. If you take a step back, you see the point here, right? So mediums, people who can communicate with the dead, with the ghosts, so to speak, they know that too, probably intuitively. So they know when they talk with a grieving widow, and they say, I'm now in touch with your, with your husband who died, unfortunately, and he's telling me some things. They know what they can tell and what they cannot tell. They stay within the frame of the natural psychology. They will tell things like, he's now in the afterlife and he wants me to tell you that he's happy there. And he's seeing you and he's happy that you picked up your life again. Uh, also, he knows that you're in touch with that colleague uh, now and you want to start a new relationship. But he's okay with that. And then the grieving widow is happy because that's what she wanted to hear, of course, also. right? And so the medium, as it's called, goes on and he says, um, and he knows that uh, maybe you want to have children with, uh, with your new partner because your husband died too young and, and you didn't have children, you want children. But he's okay with that too. He's, he's, he's telling me, I, I receive this clearly, tell her it's okay to have a child, I want her to be happy, and so on. And that's all okay. I'm looking at this and I'm saying, this is a good medium. He knows what he's doing. This guy knows his job, right? But if he then would tell the grieving widow, so he's okay with you having a new partner and having children and so on, because in fact he's now just telling me he met this uh, female ghost and they want to start a family. Uh, <laughs> maybe some ghost children, then all of a sudden the medium becomes ridiculous. Right? Everything he said before sounds really normal because he's in the frame of psychology, dualism, intentionalism, and so on. When he skips to embryology and biology, it becomes ridiculous. Also, if the medium would tell me, yes, well, I lost contact with uh, your husband now because he had to go to the bathroom or something, that would be ridiculous as well. right? Because that's not attached naturally to what the ghost has to be. See, that's, that's the line of reasoning I'm trying to make, make up here. So this is why so-called mediums can make up believable stories, although they're really, really crazy or really irrational. Sometimes it's with some help of cold and hot reading, meaning some people are really good in detecting information just by looking at people. I'm shooting randomly. I'm a medium here and I'm, say, I'm, I'm feeling something with an A, I'm feeling something with an E, um, so I'm feeling something with an O, and, and, and some people will not, right? And then I'm going to know, okay, I'm close, it's probably Uncle Roger, probably, and I can come up with five or six or ten more names with an O, and eventually I'll hit the right name, and then Uncle so or so will have died, because I feel something here in that area. Now, most people die of something in that area, right? <laughs> And then afterwards, people will, tell, people will tell other people, it's unbelievable, the medium. Unbelievable. I entered the room and he immediately knew everything 
about how Uncle Roger died. That's the way it works, right? That's called cold reading. They just read the person in front of them, right? Hot reading is when you have information in advance. We can all do that, of course, right? That's called hot reading. Also, and this is the next part of the line of reasoning here, it is very easy for believers, once you believe in it, to see signs of the presence of ghosts everywhere. For instance, the widow of André Hazes thinks that André is still following her, and she says, I'm very often confronted with the number combination 2309, the day he died. For instance, I went to the airport, and the weight of my luggage was 23.09 kilograms. This cannot be a coincidence. Now, I understand this, that if you, if you have these kinds of experiences, that you think this is unbelievable, there's more going on here than just coincidence. But the fact is, people are very, very, well, excuse me for the word here, but very stupid or ignorant when it comes to thinking in terms of statistics and probability and coincidence. We, we have no idea. Most people have no idea. Not even mathematicians very often make mistakes. Right? For instance, I'm, I'm, this is a whole lecture by itself. It's very interesting. It's very important. You should look into it. For instance, if you go to uh, the casino, right, you'll see people there, it could be yourself, who are prone to what's called the gambler fallacy. Are you familiar with the gambler fallacy? So you're playing the casino, the roulette, and say the little ball hits black 10 times in a row. Then it's very seductive to think, well, now I have to play red, of course. Because what are the odds that after 10 times black, the ball is not going to hit red? Well, it's just 50-50, right? Because that little ball has no memory. The ball is not thinking, well, I've been on black 10 times, it's time that I go for red. <laughs> That's not the way that little ball thinks, right? Same thing with filling in the numbers of the lottery. Many people think that it's a good thing to do this as randomly as possible. If you say, no, 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 I do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, many people will tell you, you're crazy. <laughs> it's impossible that this will some, somehow come out. Again, as if the balls from the lottery or the lotto know what number is on their back. They don't. They couldn't care less. They cannot care about anything at all. So it doesn't matter whether you take one, two, three, four, five, or six, or totally random. But most people think more random is better. The more random it is, the, the better it is. Also, they believe that combinations who won already, you do not have to pick them again. Because it's very unlikely that this will happen again. But at the same time, shops that paid a winning ticket will advertise this. Somebody won here, and then people will go to the store as if the tickets know in what store they have to be. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense at all, right? I have a friend who pointed that out. He's a math mathematician to his father who plays as randomly as possible. And that friend said to his father, you know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. His father didn't believe it, so my friend said, you know what? I'll play with one, two, three, four, five, six, and we'll see what, what's going to happen. So he started to play, and after a couple of months, he won something. He won 10 euros or something, right? With probably three, three numbers or something from his one, two, three, four, five, six combination. So he went to his father and he said, you see, I've won some money with, with the combination that you said was impossible. And then his father said, yes, but that's just a coincidence. <laughs> See? Let me ask you a question. How many people do you think you need to gather randomly, say in one room, to have a 50-50% chance, or 50% chance, that's the way I must say, 50% chance, that two people, that you just pick them from the street, gather them in this room here, say, the room is empty, you pick, you pick people from the street randomly, how many people do you need to have a 50% chance that two of them will be born on the same day, will have the same birthday? I could give you 15 minutes to, to, to calculate. We're not going to do that. I'm going to give you the answer. It's only 23. But that's very counterintuitive. 
Most people think it's much more, 365 days in a year and so on. It's only 23 and you already have a 50% chance of two people being born on the same day, being in the same gathering or the same group. People do not understand this. Right? They have a hard time of believing that certain things are just coincidence. Just coincidence. And this happens all the time. Right? You walk around, you think of somebody you haven't seen in two years, and all of a sudden your phone rings, and it is that person ringing you. It's very, very seductive to think that your thinking of that person has something to do with the fact that he phoned you, right? What you forget, of course, is that probably you've thought several hundreds of times about that person, and then your phone never rang. And you never think, what a weird coincidence. I've been thinking of him for at least two minutes, and he doesn't ring me. <laughs> That's not the way the brain works. You see? But billions of things happen all the time. So it's only very normal, it's very natural, that coincidences like this happen. Right? The opposite would be very strange. If you would never have these kind of strange experiences. And we all have had them. Don't make too much of them. That it's just coincidence. Except when it's not, of course. But then you'll know the, the causal reasoning behind it. Huh? Okay. Another reason why we are prone to rationalism is because our senses are imperfect. It's very easy to see faces in the clouds, so to speak. In general, what that means is that the brain is constantly trying to make sense of what's coming in through the five senses. The brain cannot stand to feel blind, so to speak. Right? It hates it when things are coming in and it cannot make sense of it. It tries to make meaning, to, to blow meaning into things, even, it's, even when it's totally, totally random. That's why it's easy to see ghosts if you look for them. Here, for instance, these children are um, made uh, anonymous just for privacy reasons. But say you take a picture of your two children and then you notice this in the water. And maybe somebody drowned there, say. Well, uh, it's very seductive again to think something really strange is going on here. Or say you take a picture of your house. Maybe you want to sell it. You want to put it on the internet. And you notice something strange over there, right? You take a closer look. You see this <laughs> face-like figure while you know you're living there alone, right? Or again, you take a picture of a kid and you see this here popping up. <laughs> it's hard to resist that something strange is going on here. Well, in fact, this is only normal, of course. If the brain does not see an explanation for a strange phenomenon, it will invent one. And I'll give you examples to make the point in a minute. Sometimes, as a side remark, sometimes the believing ghost has a, a normal rational explanation. Well, I, I think what I said so far is also a normal rational explanation. But what I mean is a, a, an explanation in the physical stuff around us. For instance, Richard Wiseman, British psychologist, has done some research on the effect of infrasound, that sound that we cannot hear. But nevertheless, the brain picks it up. And on some people, it has a weird effect. If I would do the experiment here, I would expose you to infrasound, and about 25% of you would afterwards tell me, if I would ask for it, did you, did you feel something strange? 25% of you would say, yes, I, my, my hair was standing up, uh, I felt cold, I was shivering, uh, and I had no idea why. That's the effect of infrasound. So imagine there's a source of infrasound somewhere in your neighborhood, could be anything. It could be coming from a factory or, or uh, whatever, and you don't know what it is, but every night you lay awake and you, you feel the presence of a strange thing in your house, right? Then every sound you hear, everything you see, you, you're going to... Related to that, of course. Right? While in fact it's just the effect of infrasound. Could be things like that too. 
So more examples of the side effect explanation, or what I also could call the psychological overshooting effect, or the taking it too far effect, seeing things that are not there, and so on. In combination with what I've said about intentionality, dualism, and the other things, you'll recognize this for what it is. It's just a chair. But for your brain, or part of your brain, it's a chair that's looking angry at you. <laughs> it's not just looking at you. It's angrily looking at you. It has intentionality. It has a mind. Right? Once you see it, it's hard to get rid of it. <laughs> this speaks for itself. You see, your brain does not need much. This is just the leaf of a plant laying on the ground, but you see a face in it. You pr probably see a female, even a beautiful female face in it. Well, that's just crazy, and you know it. But you cannot escape it. <laughs> this washing machine feels nauseous, and we know why. We can feel what she's feeling, almost, right? Imagine, I'm inventing this story now, but you know why I'm inventing this, and, and it's a plausible thing, I guess. Imagine you went to a funeral, right? Your best friend died, and you went to a funeral. His funeral, it's a very emotional thing, of course. You took the, took the day off from work or classes, and you're making a walk in nature afterwards just by yourself, you know, because your, your friend has just been buried and so on. And uh, you have your smartphone with you, and you, you're taking some pictures, as you always do. And in the evening, you're looking at the pictures. You, you attach it to your computer screen, and then you see this. You saw some birds, and you took a picture, not really thinking about it. And then you see this. Well, I think it's very hard not to think that your friend is giving you the signal, using these birds, that it's okay with him, or something like that. Right? That's a very human, normal thing to think. Well, in fact... Nothing of the sort is true, I guess. I cannot prove this, but... Okay. So, blowing meaning and information in random dots. That's what we're doing. And it works for all the senses, of course. I'm going to give you another example. An auditory example. You're all familiar, I guess, with Led Zeppelin. Led Zeppelin was a rock band. From the earlier days, yes. Still worth listening to. Most of you will be familiar with the song Stairway to Heaven, right? We're going to listen to a little, little part of it. It's coming up right away, if it works. If there's a bustle in your head, don't be alone there. It's just a sprinkly for the May Queen. Yes, there are two paths you can go by, but in the long run. Could you read the lines also in the back of the song? Okay, so this was just a part of Stairway to Heaven, and you could follow the lyrics here, all right? Now we're going to listen to that part, but backwards. And that's, of course, totally nonsensical. What else would it be, right? It's the same words, but we listen to it backwards. There we go. Okay, total nonsense, as you would expect. But the brain hates this. So when we give the brain a little hand and give it the illusion of information, it will go for it. So I'm going to give you lyrics now, nonsensical lyrics. Okay, over here. While we are listening to the same backwards piece of music again. Still time to the Coming up in a second. Oh, 
So you understand the point. And I could give many, many other examples of the same logic. For instance, you're all familiar with Nostradamus, I guess, right? French visionary poet who predicted many things, for the believers at least. Here is something that I got in my mailbox a couple of days after 9-11, the 9-11 Catastrophe, you're all familiar with that, of course. In fact, during that month, the month after 9-11, Nostradamus was the second most searched word on internet search machines ever, in that month. The, second word, the, the first word was Osama Bin Laden. Okay, I can understand that. But the second word was Nostradamus, and this is very strange. But I think this has something to do with it. I got this in my mailbox a couple of times even, maybe some of you did too, from friends or people that I know or that know me. And they told me, well, apparently Nostradamus wrote this. What are you going to say now? Because they, they know how I think, right? So I'm reading this to you. In the city of God, this is a couple of days after 9-11. In the city of God, there will be a great thunder, two brothers torn apart by chaos, while the fortress endures, the great leader will succumb. The third big war will begin when the big city is burning. On the 11th day of the ninth month, two metal birds will crash into two tall statues in the new city, and the world will end soon after. Not bad, right? Yeah. I think when 100 people read this, but it must have been many, many millions, maybe 99% of them thought, well, Nostradamus is that guy. Uh, he sure knew what he was writing down. It's maybe only 1% who goes into it. And then you discover, of course, that Nostradamus never wrote this. I copied this literally from the mail that I got. For instance, Nostradamus wrote this in 1654. Quite interesting for somebody who died in 1566, right? <laughs> also, when you look in the collected works of Nostradamus, you're not going to find this. Not in the French original edition, but also not in the English translation. For the obvious reason, he never wrote this. We know who wrote this, and, and it's a kind of ironic thing. This was a student who wrote this a couple of days after 9-11 for a school project to prove how vulnerable the mind is. And it got a little bit out of hand. It was too successful, and people took it for a real Nostradamus text and forwarded it to many, many people. Well, of course, Nostradamus never wrote this. But it's very easy to read these things and see a true prediction in it. One last example of the same phenomenon. Many, many people still believe in astrology. Astrology means many things. But here I'm talking of the astrology that tells you that the day and the moment you were born is connected to where the planets and so forth and the stars were at the time of your birth. And this says something about your personality. <coughs> right? Even already... From an astronomical point of view, this is a very strange idea. What kind of power would the planets have on every newborn baby's psychology? That doesn't make any sense at all. In fact, the doctor who might be there while you're born, has, his gravity effect is more large than, than stars or planets and so on. So it's, it's full of nonsensical ideas, right? Nevertheless... Bertram Forer, a psychologist, did a really interesting study. He said to an audience just like this, it probably were students, doesn't matter, that he knew the day and the year of birth of everybody and the names, students, say. And he gave all of the names and the days of births to a professional astrologer. And he made up a psychological profile of everybody. So Professor Forer had the envelopes with the names, uh, and handed them to everybody, called the names, and then gave it. And so you're reading this. You take five minutes, you're reading your profile that the astrologer made. And then Forer asked, uh, for how many people is this, uh, does this make sense? And almost everybody said, 
This is unbelievable. This is spot on. This is who I am. And then Forrest said, well, now, randomly, give your paper to somebody else. <laughs> Turned out everybody had exactly the same profile. <laughs> so he made it up. He made it up from astrological texts. He made it up as if it was a real astrological profile for individual persons. But it was a profile that was just, that fitted everybody. The logic here is that the brain is blowing meaning into that text. Here is the text, and I'm sure it will apply to most of you here. Let me read you a few lines. You have a need for other people to like and admire you, and yet you tend to be critical of yourself. While you have some personality weaknesses, you are generally able to compensate for them. You have considerable unused capacity that you have not turned to your, to your advantage. But I can tell you this is me, really. <laughs> And the rest, too. And the same goes for you, probably. See, This is what our brain does. I'm guessing my time is pretty much up, right? So I'm going to end with this uh, slide. I have not discussed the cognitive dissonance explanation and other things. So it's more complicated, of course, than I'm capable of telling you here. But I think the most important things I've, I've pointed out. So let me end with this. Insightful idea, I think. It's not mine. Um, the brain is, in fact, set like an alarm, a fire alarm. There's one over there on the ceiling. There's probably more. The idea is that a good fire alarm needs to be set a little bit too precise. So if somebody lit a cigar there, the alarm must go off. Why? Because it's much, 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 much more important and better that the alarm goes off for the wrong reason than when it does not go off while, in fact, it should go off. See the point? So maybe a hundred cigars will be lit, every week one, and every time the alarm will go off. But if you would say then, well, this is just too... Ridiculous, this alarm always goes off for wrong reason. It's just a cigar. We're going to set it down. And then a real fire happens. And then the alarm is not going to sound because it's going to think, so to speak, it's probably just a cigar. That's the way our mind works. So we are all slightly paranoid. Not in the pathological sense. This, this is the normal brain set, the default position, so to speak. I think for good evolutionary reasons, think about it, you were walking around on the savanna in Africa, well, not you, but your great, 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 great grandfather and mother, right? Thousands of generations ago. And you hear a strange noise in the bushes. If you think, this is probably a lion, so I better run off. And afterwards you see, no, it was not a lion, it's just a rabbit. Then you made a mistake. Maybe it's a bit ridiculous. Maybe people will make fun of you. But it's not such a really big mistake. You just thought it was a lion while it was a rabbit. You run away for nothing. So what? You can make that mistake hundreds of times. It's no big deal. You can make that mistake every day. It's no big deal. But think about making a mistake on the other side. If you hear a noise and you think, oh, it's just a rabbit, while in fact it's a lion, that's a mistake you can only make once, <laughs> right? So we are all descendants, that's the word I was looking for, descendants of people who made the mistakes on the good side. We're not descendants of people who made the mistake on the wrong side. So our brain is set a little bit too high, as it should, in a sense. If you're laying awake at night and you hear a strange noise, you might think... Oh, it's the wind, it's the cat, and so on. But you'll probably think, a burger. And you probably will make a mistake. It is probably the wind or the cat. But it's normal that you're making that mistake on that side. Statistically, you're going to make it more on that side than on uh, the other side. Okay, may, may I have two more minutes? Okay, this is something I also need to point out. That's, that's, it's another... 
another part of the line of reasoning that I'm developing here, and I promise you with this I'll end. Superstition and irrational thinking is also based on what I call the contamination principle, which is in fact the same thing as what we usually call magical thinking. And it's in line with what I've said so far. People are highly prone to magical thinking. Magical thinking means that you, that you think there's some essential power in something that really doesn't have a power at all. For instance, in the Catholic tradition, there's many relics. You've heard of relics, reliquien. For instance, the hand of somebody, a tooth, a piece of hair, a piece of bone. When it comes to Jesus, of course, there's very important relics. Um, the, the, the crown of thorns, uh, nails that went through his hand on the cross, pieces of the cross itself, and, and so on. These are relics. People believe that when you touch them, or even when you just see them, or visit the places where they're kept, that this can have a good effect on you. Right? People go visit them by the millions, because they think when we touch these relics, it's good for health, or it's good for exams, or it's good for fertility, or it's good for relationships, or anything. This is, of course, highly, highly irrational. Why would a a tooth of somebody who died in the Middle Ages, if you touch it, have a healthy effect on you. In fact, probably the opposite could be true, right? More likely, right? There, for instance, to point out how irrational this is, there's two skulls kept from the saint called Jacob. Two skulls, a small one and a large one. And the small one is from when he was a child. <laughs> but it doesn't matter to people. They still believe that both have yeah, magical powers, in a sense. Now, this is not just something, and that's the point I'm making here, this is not just something that people believe in who are Catholics. This is just one way of the way it works in the Catholic tradition. But it's, again, based on a form of reasoning that we all are familiar with. It exists in so-called secular forms Two, I, ha I have a few examples here. You're familiar with voodoo, for instance. That not, that's the same line of reasoning, but not in the Catholic tradition. This is a hairlock of Marilyn Monroe. And you all know people will pay a lot of money for a hairlock of Marilyn Monroe. Or a piece of chewing gum that was in the mouth of Britney Spears. R true examples. A tooth of John Lennon, and so on. Underwear of Elvis Presley, very expensive. In fact, people will tell you, if my house burns down, and I can only rescue one thing, it's going to be the hairlock of whoever they have a hairlock of. This is very, very irrational, and it's not a religious thing. Religion just can end itself, is that good English? Probably not, but you know what I mean, on these kinds of beliefs. And so we, you two, are vulnerable for this. And I'm going to end with giving you a couple of examples, two examples. For instance, say I have a jacket here with me, and it's a beautiful jacket, it's a nice jacket, I'm telling you it's second hand, but it's clean, it's, uh, I washed it a couple of times and I'm giving it to this gentleman over here and it's, it fits you perfectly, right? I'm giving it to you as a present. Then normally you're going to be happy, you're going to say thank you and you're going to wear the jacket because everybody says you look really beautiful with the jacket. But then I'm telling you it belonged to a serial killer or a child rapist. It belonged to somebody like Marc Dutroux, right? What are you going to do? You're not going to wear it, exactly. Well, so you're very, very irrational, right? Because <laughs> there's nothing wrong with the jacket. But it's going to feel very creepy. The moment I'm telling you, it, it looks wonderful on you. And by the way, it belonged to Marc Dutroux, right? <laughs> you're not going to be able to wear it anymore. And if you would shake it off, you could say, you know what, this is ridiculous. I'm going to be a rational person here. It's not because I'm wearing this jacket that I'm going to kidnap children or, or rape women. Or, I'm not going to do that. It's ridiculous to think that this can have an effect on me, which is true. This would be rational, good reasoning. Still, if you would wear it, and you would go to your friends in your uh, bar, uh, your local bar, and you say, what do you think of my, my new jacket? Uh, it used to belong to Marc Dutroux then people will think, you have to be avoided. 
as if you can be contaminated some, somehow with the evil spirit somehow. This is very irrational thinking, but it's all, it all makes sense to us. I think it might be a side effect of normal psychology, also coming from prehistory, that is somehow rational. It is somehow rational to avoid certain things because they can contain microorganisms, and microorganisms can, in fact, kill you or make you ill. Right? But we cannot know the difference because we never knew what microorganisms were before the microscope was invented and so on. Right? And the disease theory concerning microorganisms organisms come from the 19th century. This is, for instance, if I would make soup here for you, I have a huge bowl of soup here on, on a stove, and the smell is wonderful, and the soup is almost ready, and I'm telling you, everybody who wants to have some soup, you come over, and I'm giving you some soup, but then I need to stir the soup, and I don't have something to stir the soup with, except I go look there, and I find a toilet brush. But the toilet brush is wrapped in plastic. It's clean. It's, it's coming right from the store. It's never been used. But I'm stirring the soup with the toilet brush. So I say, that'll, that'll do. <laughs> How many of you will come for the soup? Maybe a few people, maybe a few people. But you see that the point I'm making. And this is normal human psychology. But you don't need, it's, it's a small trigger and you fall into some form of irrational thinking, okay? I'll leave it with that. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, we have a couple of minutes for a few questions, so if you'd like to know about what we didn't have time to talk about today, now there's your chance. Kirsten is going to do some jogging and uh, <laughs> I'll be standing here. One second. <laughs> wait for the microphone, please. Hold on a second. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on a second. One second. Hello. I have a question. Uh, uh, thank you. First of all, thanks for the nice. Uh, uh, presentation that you gave about an uh, interesting uh, topic. I was just curious if you happen to know another uh, speaker that uh, was here for Studium Generalum before, Mr. Rupert Sheldrake in his latest book, uh, The Science Delusion. And if, if you do uh, know his book, did you read it? I, I know who Rupert Sheldrake is. I have not read all of his books. I went to a talk that he gave. Uh, I read uh, his book uh, called something like seven experiments that could change the world or something like that. So I'm familiar with who Rupert Sheldrick is. And I think he's a very interesting man, because for those of you who do not know who Rupert Sheldrick is, he is trying to figure out ways to do research on, well, so-called strange phenomena. Like, for instance, uh, the feeling that, that we can all have that somebody is staring at you. Right? And then you turn around and there is actually somebody staring at you. Or the reason why uh, pigeons find their way back home, although they come from Barcelona, for instance, they've never been in Barcelona, and still they manage to get back home and so on. So he believes that, that there's something going on that science has not been able to explain up till now. And he's trying to, and, and this I respect highly, trying to figure out ways to test these things, or he's proposing this. I must say, so far, when his proposals are actually indeed tested, some of them were already tested before he proposed it, it turned out to be, to be nothing. For instance, the, the feeling of being stared at uh, turns out that sometimes you, you, know, you know it and sometimes you don't. It does not rise above chance. Um, his idea on why <coughs> pigeons find their way back. He thought there was what he called maybe a, a morphogenetic field between the pigeon and the place where they, where they live normally. If you remove the, uh, yeah, the pigeon houses, right, the Dervecoten, um, they land where the pigeon house was, but not, they don't go to the other place and so on. 
So, so far, nothing really has come out of it. He also, for instance, believes that dogs have maybe, maybe somehow telepathic powers, and so they can know when their boss, say, uh, is coming home from work or from whatever. Interesting proposal. Many people have that experience. Many people will tell you, I come home, and uh, I open the door, and there's my dog waiting for me. And he could not know. Uh, I did not give him a signal or anything like that. Well, you're familiar with these stories. Well, the fact is, um, if you have a camera in the house and you see what the dog is doing, it comes back and forth to the door maybe 50 times, right, <laughs> a day. So the chances that you open the door and the dog will be there are pretty high. So you have to approach this from a statistical point of view, and it does not rise above what you expect from chance. So I, I respect Rupert Sheldrick highly, and it's very interesting that he tries to figure out ways to, to do scientific experiments, but nothing so far has come out of it. Well, um, I not completely uh, agree with you on that topic. Uh, anyhow, and uh, Mr. Rupert Sheldrick uh, would probably have a, a very good answer in, in return. But uh, I think uh, with his latest book, uh, the most important message that he gave is uh, basically what Frank Zappa calls uh, the mind doesn't function if it's not open. And uh, one of the most important things, I believe, in uh, looking for the truth, and which is uh, part of your uh, subject here, is that you should never exclude other uh, options. And that's uh, uh, the, uh, may, maybe the downside of this presentation, or the, the opposite side if you uh, look at it too simplistic, because it's, uh, you just uh, uh, exclude other options too easy. And we have seen many, many, many examples of that in the traditional science. And as James and, Randi and says, it's good to, to be open-minded, but not so open-minded that your brain spill out. Let's take two more questions and then... Right, well, okay. Yeah, but I, I'm gonna give a brief response, of course, to this. Um, no, I'm, I'm open, and I think science in general, maybe not individual scientists, of course, they're just human beings, but science in general is open to any alternative explanation or approach. But, of course, it needs to be, you need to be able to test it in a sound methodological way. And once it's tested enough times, and it turns out to be nothing, then you leave it at that, right? So one, we need to figure out a way to find somehow a good balance between open-mindedness on the one hand and vulnerability on the other hand, right? Because when you have an open mind, the problem is uh, anything can come in. If you have no, no filter, then how are you going to make the difference between something reasonable and something less reasonable? That's what sounds is all, science is all about. I, I did not hear this. I did not hear this. Uh, most science uh, progresses have been made by people that had an open mind and, and, uh, and sure. uh, went but, in yeah. different directions. But what makes you think that science would not be open-minded? The opposite is true, of course. But if you make an extraordinary claim, you need to have extraordinary proof. I can go as crazy as I want, say, on, in a scientific conference or in a scientific journal. I can say anything I want, right? But people who, who know what I'm talking about will immediately try to shoot holes in my theory. That's what it's all about. That's how science pro makes progress, by elimination of hypotheses and ideas and so on that are simply not working, right? So science is a self-eliminating process, and that's one of the main differences, I think, with pseudoscience. But pseudoscience keeps on existing, Although it has been proven to be wrong, not functioning, debunked, and so on, it keeps on existing. In science, after a certain amount of time, can be quick, can be long, bad science will get eliminated. And that's the way we make progress. But, but you can propose anything, so to speak. If you, your evidence is good enough, it will be eventually accepted. Eventually. I should also like to say a thank you to you for a very interesting lecture. I wonder if you'd like to comment on this. On the 21st of November in 2007, I went into a supermarket. I bought 
goods to the value of three pounds and 33 pence. Thinking about the magical number of 666, I merely commented to the checkout lady, what an interesting account this is, 303 pounds and 33 pence. Believe it or not, and while I don't have the account receipts here this evening, the next customer comes along and his bill, believe it or not, was six pounds and 66 pence. Yeah. Now, how often does such a figure actually work out? You have to believe me, and I do have, I have kept the receipts, but sadly they're in Britain. I want to remark on in the introduction to the works, the black and white graphics of Charles Tomlinson, where in the introduction um, given by the author Pez, he says, has it all been um, an element of chance? But what is meant by chance? Chance is never produced by chance. Chance possesses a logic because uh, we have yet to discover the rules of something. We have no reason to doubt that there are rules. Yeah. No, I understand the point. Yeah. Well, I think sometimes, of course, there's an underlying pattern in what we believe to be random. So that, that's, that's also what science is about, find the underlying pattern. But sometimes chance, I think, is just chance. The wonderful example that you give, and congratulations on your memory, by the way, because this is impressive that you remember this uh, so precisely. Um, but things like this are quite normal quite normal. Uh, in fact, there's been some good research published lately in some very readable books like uh, uh, Taleb, uh, Nicholas Taleb, or the, the guy who wrote The Drunkenman's Wandering. Yeah, some people will know what I'm talking about. You, you, you'll find, you can find the, refer the, re the references. It's, there's nothing unusual about the example you give, although, of course, the impression it made on you, and perhaps the girl who works there and the customer behind you, must be very strong. I, I can believe that, but there's many, many examples like this. For instance, okay, let me very briefly, for instance, I mentioned 9-11. You, you know that in the 90s, there was also an attack on the Twin Towers. Most people know this, I guess. Well, there's a person who happened to be there twice as a tourist on the days of the attacks, and he both survived them. There's people who survive more than two or three plane crashes. There's one man in the Guinness Book of World Records, and he survived six times a lightning stroke that hit him. And he was not looking for it, of course. He died afterwards of a heart attack. No, no connection with the lightning. I mean, things like this happen, and that's only normal. That's only normal. For instance, we all, almost all, have dreams every night. It's only normal that once in a while, somebody's dream will apparently have been uh, a forewarning of something. You dream of an airplane and, and next day uh, a plane crashes. I mean, these things happen. You do not make something of other things because they don't apply to your, the way your brain works. But they're, from a statistical point of view, they're as highly unlikely as the example that you are giving. See? But we happen not to see a pattern in it. But everything is as unlikely as the example as you give. Every combination is. Let me end, end with this. The interesting thing is that we can predict very with, with confidence that things like this will happen all the time. We cannot predict the precise thing that will happen. See what I mean? I can predict that you will have, that all of you will, experiences, will experience coincidences like what the gentleman just pointed out. But I cannot tell that you will experience this particular coincidence on that particular day. That, of course, I cannot do. That's the way insurances work, by the way, too. 
Okay. Let's take one last question. There's one in the back, I think. Do I see that right? Yeah. Uh, hi, thank you for the lecture. I have to be sure to phrase my question correctly. Now, I missed exactly what the ideal situation is for a researcher like you or the one you idolized, with, whose name I forgot. But presuming that, because our brains will probably remain the same for centuries to go, uh, presuming that we will always have a sense of superstition and irrationality, is there a situation that you um, would envision that irrationality has a logical place in our lives because eventually it may not be irrationality that is most important for us, but the effects we achieve in life. Say, with the coat um, that's on the slide there, if I feel uncomfortable knowing that it's an irrational feeling that I'm wearing the coat of a serial killer, would it not be useful to say the most effective thing is to not wear the coat, even though it's irrational, that it, it is more effective for me as a person. So where is the line? Where do you draw the line? Do you say we have to all seek rationality, or do you say at some point the nice balance between irrationality and effectiveness, if you will, results? Can you rephrase the last sentence? Is there a point where you see that instead of seeking for true rationality, that a, com a balance between rationality and the results that are most positive for you in real life terms uh, is the ideal situation? Well, I'm not sure whether, whether I understand, if I understand your question correctly, but can I rephrase it like this? Are you asking me? whether irrational thinking can have positive effects on us, or is that too simple? In a sense, yes. That, is, that it could almost have an essential part okay. uh, of our lives. Okay, v very good question. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to be brief, right, considering the hour. First of all, Yes, that is correct. I do think that uh, it's not very likely that we're going to grow into more rational beings uh, within a couple of generations, because we're still going to have the same brain also within 500 or even 5,000 years. And the interesting thing is that, as I try to point out, irrationality in many cases is a side effect of the things in our brain that we don't want to get rid of. If you would go to a neurosurgeon and you would ask him, uh, cut out the parts of the brain that make me irrational, you would not be a human being anymore, right? So you don't want to lose that. So we will always be prone to irrationality. That, that's one thing. Another thing is, I think, in many cases, it's a bad thing. It's a bad thing because we pay a high price for this. Irrationality leads to xenophobia, racism, genocide, uh, to, to people being fooled and, and cheated by dishonest people and so on, right? So there's a lot to be said for making ourselves into more rational beings. At the same time, on the other side, and this is now where I come to the, the basic issue of your question, I also think that being irrational can sometimes be a good thing for us. I'm not in favor of it, really, but I do think that there are good reasons to say that being irrational can sometimes be a good thing. I should give examples, of course, or make myself more clear, but, um, well, one line of reasoning is that I did not develop this because I didn't have the time, but we are quite prone to self-deception. Most people, for instance, will be the last person to know that their relationship is doomed, for instance. Or that their child has become a drug addict, or things like this. 
we, we are very prone to self-deception. Cognitive dissonance kicks in and so on. I mean, there's a whole literature on that. Why is that? Part probably of the explanation is that it keeps our, ourselves stable, so to speak. It keeps ourselves coherent. It's very hard to deal with knowledge that you have behaved and, or that you are thinking irrational. Also, you can lose a lot by giving up irrational thinking. Another thing that I didn't explain is that being irrational can be an important part of what it means to be a member of the group. Being irrational can be the label that proves that you are a loyal group member. Right? We all know how hard it is for people who are born and raised into a certain belief system to get out of it. If you say to your group members, you know what, I don't believe in this or that anymore, then you're going to become an outcast probably. But your group is important to you. Be belonging to a group is important to everybody. So accepting the irrational belief system of the group is a condition to be a true member of the group. So it's good for you to be irrational because it's good for you to be a member of a group. See, so these lines of reasoning I can develop and it's out there in the literature to make the point that being irrational has lots of positive effects too. That doesn't mean that, that therefore I'm in favor of it, but that's an ethical issue. Should you live in truth or searching for the truth, whatever that is, and paying a, a huge price for it sometimes? Or should you look maybe for happiness? And maybe being irrational can make you more happy, who's to say, in some cases. Is this somehow the answer that you, you were expecting? I've enjoyed your answer, so thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Thank you very much.